So I recently finished up Metal Gear Solid 5 and I absolutely loved it. I 100% of the game with over 200 hours put into it, I S ranked missions for the fun of it, I actively sought to get all the mission objectives, and I even tried to get as many no trace runs as I thought were possible. A thought kept creeping into my head though, people think this is the worst Metal Gear game? I wouldn't call this an absolutely perfect experience, but I'd say it's close to one and a marked step up from Peace Walker and Guns of the Patriots, so what's the disconnect? Upon thinking about what I enjoyed about this game, I realized that I may have been the perfect target audience member. What I enjoy about this game isn't inherently universal, my sensibilities may have accidentally been pandered to, and my mindset while playing the game may have been the one needed to appreciate the best portions of this game. But what if this wasn't just about Phantom Pain? What if this was the case for a much larger audience? that perhaps some of the most beloved games were simply very focused and targeted efforts that struck the right chord to have any shortcomings forgiven by their target audiences. Are the games that are the most treasured and well-loved only regarded that way because they had large audiences who perfectly matched the sensibilities and tastes needed to appreciate the game? I guess we should start with what I liked so much about the game while spoiling as little as possible. Phantom Pain will be my example for this, but you can really just think of anything with a large enough following. I enjoyed how Phantom Pain's individual missions didn't really feel railroaded most of the time. How, even in the first mission, there's a degree of complexity with what you can do. Replaying missions gave me new things to try out in movement, equipment, and tactics for completing the mission. Aggressively running into enemies to activate reflex mode and getting lethal headshots is as viable as using a water pistol to hold up enemies and make them lie down, or completely sneaking past enemies to ensure no one even knows you're there. The missions themselves become something you organically learn to break down and understand in ways that make different options more apparent and fun to try out. Once you start going to secondary objectives that have you explore and play in different ways, the missions and maps get their own flow that you can play around with. It became a really rewarding challenge for me to see how much I could do with low GMP costing loadouts, and working around self-imposed challenges was really rewarding when I thought about how missions could be done differently. It reminded me a lot of how I enjoyed playing Dark Souls with weird focuses on weapons and equipment restrictions. You have to change your style, but you find ways to make your existing skills work with it. Whether it's the satisfaction of noticing different damage output, or the feedback I'd get from the scoring and mother base mechanics, I liked the feedback the games would give you for having a different style, even if it isn't always directly. The mission end grades, the weapon development system using materials and money, different rankings based on your tactics, and percentage indications were enough feedback for me to start trying to get more out of the missions, and once I got enough of an idea of how the missions play, I was having a blast. Even without the missions, I really enjoyed exploring the sandbox to find supplies, steal soldiers, collect music, and destroy anti-air radar. Once I got quiet, her combination of offensive and support capabilities made this process just feel incredibly rewarding. She made exploring between side ops have a much better sense of purpose and direction, and it was glorious. The back and forth of the intense stealth gameplay with the calm exploration and collection portions reminded me of my experience playing Resident Evil 4, where the tension of the action scenes contrasted well with the puzzle and collection portions. Unlike Resident Evil 4 though, your buddies rarely feel like they're in the way, and spending so much time with them actually gave me a sense of camaraderie. Organic fun events just sort of kept happening while playing with the buddies in a way that felt natural and unplanned. Like how well I'd work with Quiet when we both wielded lethal sniper rifles, or how I'd mess up and get seen only for Quiet to bail me out by killing the guard. It feels like organic storytelling that shows you how skilled and caring the buddies are, without needing to resort to dialogue or interrupting the gameplay at all. It almost gave me a Pokemon vibe where they'd somehow pull out miracles in battle they really shouldn't have. Being in hopeless situations that you got through thanks to your buddy is something that really resonates with me and it is easy for me to like the characters I was spending so much time with, making the time even more enjoyable. 
This experience of exploring the map like an adventure game, playing the missions like a combination of an action and a puzzle game, and the rewarding and enticing system to do better made Phantom Pain incredible for me. Buddy has arrived at sniping the map. Of course, there were things I didn't like, and these failures cannot be ignored despite the game's best efforts. I didn't like the story, which is mostly try-hardy, let's be serious scenes, with effectively grisly scenes that still felt off. Some scenes work for the moment, but don't have much lasting payoff, and they don't gel well with what the game does best. The disturbing violence feels at odds with the more ridiculous portions and take away from the more fun pieces of the game. Violence is usually cathartic or emotional, but here it just felt like they wanted to have something graphic to catch the audience's attention because they didn't know how to do it with just storytelling. The story didn't hook me enough to want answers or reactions out of characters, so I never cared much for any of the questions or mysteries that were being built. Even though a lot of detail went to building up the suspense, it never made me curious enough to want to know the answers. What do they want? What's their objective? Why Afghanistan? Not that the mostly uninteresting cast had me engaged regardless. Ocelot, Miller, and Snake may be center stage, but I found all of them to be lacking any energy or presence. What they said or did failed to make me feel like they were part of the world I was exploring or worth the attention to learn about their characters. As much as I liked the environments, an issue I had was how many buildings were just locked out. MGS is usually pretty good at building indoor stealth sections that still have personality and charm to them, so losing potentially enjoyable content to explore is unfortunate. Not only do I take issue with little pieces of the world, but one of the buddies as well, because D-Dog does not know where he should be, or more accurately, where he shouldn't be. He has an annoying habit of bumping into enemies I'm stalking, extending enemy movement routines, and getting in the way of a punch. I will eventually defend some of the issues I've been discussing, but there are two big flaws I won't give that honor. The missing walker gear, and the Eli storyline content. They are gaping holes of content that don't even try to hide how unfinished they are. While some claims of the missing content are exaggerated, this gave enough people reason to believe things were just taken away from them. While the storyline is unfinished, what's there isn't exactly great, and enough of these flaws are reason for some to totally despise the game. Yet, despite how flawed this game is, I was surprised at how much I wasn't bothered by most of them. Skipping cutscenes is super quick, at least on my six years out of date PC, and since I wasn't hooked into the story, I wasn't really disappointed by its general lack of presence, character, or quality since they just felt like passing distractions between the actually fun parts. For once in the series, cutscenes are a much smaller portion of the game than the actual gameplay, so the story feels more optional than before. I also like that you're basically in control of how much of the story you want to take in, as few missions force story participations and logistical explanations for the surreal can be listened to at your own leisure or while riding to the next destination. This reminded me a lot of what I grew to eventually dislike about Red Dead Redemption that you were forced during almost every mission to listen to someone on horseback for a minute with very little to do other than follow the road. Speaking of Red Dead, I actually enjoyed exploring the calm, pretty setting as long as I had some direction, and it really helps to have something to listen to now. Ocelot and Miller not having much of a presence meant they generally faded into the background, at least until they talked over the tapes. Who would have thought they'd hide it there? You secured the target, now you just need to bring it back. The locked out buildings also don't make their presence known frequently in such open environments, and D-Dog is so good as radar that it's hard for me to stay mad at him because, well, I need him. There was a flaw that was getting to me over time, and that was Big Boss being blander than Super Bland, the blandest man in the world. However, that changed once my mother base soldiers got high enough rankings to be usable instead of Snake. I ended up getting really attached to two excellent soldiers, Blue O Spray and Bitter Mantis. 
who can survive bigger falls, have decent enough abilities to be worth missing some of Snake's perks, and who have much nicer looking butts. The general trend here is that the big problems also give you a means to not see them as often. Whether intentionally or not, Phantom Pain gives the player enough tools to bypass the biggest flaws the game has, and allows a motivated player to focus on what the game does well. What one could consider a flaw is different between players, but two defining factors for this are the player's expectations and the playstyle preference. My expectations on the game started not with a trailer, but with Peace Walker. I liked the gameplay, a lot, but I hated the boss battles and the story. I had no interest in seeing where the series went after that. Even when the next game was announced, I didn't follow it much further than hearing about a scantily clad woman and seeing a whale on fire. I eventually got Ground Zeroes on the cheap, really enjoyed the game, getting 40 hours out of its 7 missions, and I became cautiously optimistic at the idea of another game. Having not played the game at launch, opinions were all over the place, and eventually I was gifted this game from a loyal fan, and came in expecting the worst, but knew there'd be good to find. That long setup is to establish what was different about my expectations of this game from others. I had no interest in seeing where the series went, so I had no expectations for how it would play. A Metal Gear sandbox didn't clash with my vision for the series, because I really didn't have one after Peace Walker. I wasn't looking forward to the traditional MGS bosses, because I hated the boss battles in Peace Walker. The boss battles actually surprised me by both being good and being relevant to the gameplay style for once, even if there were only three of them. Kojima and the trailers promised story beats that didn't happen, which is kind of a regular thing with him. I never saw these promises or interviews, so I never came in expecting the story that isn't there. My expectations for this game worked well in its favor, and so did my playstyle. Besides a warning from a fan about the language of Kikongo, the joy I got from playing this game is primarily because of how I play games. I went back repeatedly to go for S ranks and all objectives relatively early, and grew to love that portion of playing the game. The idea of cruising around a big sandbox while listening to the tapes is appealing to me, but I can understand how it can make the game boring and tedious. I like to optimize any sense of score that I can understand, so the ratings and objectives were very motivating and satisfying to me, but I can see how they could make you feel insulted or needlessly rushed to finish missions. I found something personally rewarding in the mother base mechanics and the buddy mechanics. It's really cool to see the in-game mechanics have context and grow as you improve. This is why, for all the story's faults, it has two moments that felt huge for me. It's easy to see, though, that they can feel like busy work, and for those who didn't play Peace Walker, it could feel very not Metal Gear. It's very easy to understand that even though there were things I enjoyed about this game, that they could be the exact same things people absolutely despise, especially since so many of them run contrary to what Metal Gear players wanted and expected in their new game. What you like in games are formed by many things, but an obvious one should be other games you've played. The games I've listed off previously weren't just random comparisons. They were specifically picked because they're all flawed games that excel in specific ways. Red Dead Redemption is a solid sandbox game with a relatively unexplored setting and time with a very absorbing structure that lets you take in the well-realized and interesting characters. But it ultimately became a tedious game for me to play because of how it chose to detail its world and characters. The fact that this presentation reminded me of Red Dead may have even given me a sense of this is how you do it which might have even elevated my opinion on the game. Even so, Red Dead came out when the traditional GTA style was played out, but familiar, and a demand for more story-heavy content was in, so it was easy for most to appreciate what Red Dead did well. Speaking of the Grand Theft Auto games, the mayhem you could cause was a new idea to most that could also be satisfying, thrilling, and fun. The cities themselves were even great to explore for weapons, collectibles, ramps, and side missions. Since the mayhem was fun, but you had to play the missions to find more stuff, the game was organically balanced between the calmer missions and the hectic destruction. But if you're only playing the missions, 
that might have passed you by, and the limited combat controls might have been frustrating with such a narrow focus on what you can do. Much like choosing to only play Phantom Pain Story Mode pushes other fun elements to the side. Dark Souls has an initial overwhelming expectation of what you should understand, but is incredibly fun if you can figure out a decent plan of action, much like how the missions in Phantom Pain are much more enjoyable once you've got a grasp on what to do. There was a huge hole in the market for challenging games, and its narrative presentation was something that encouraged people to keep looking for details and kept them engaged, especially since its reputation prepared people to expect some frustration. Ocarina of Time is only about 55% of the game that it was supposed to be on the Nintendo 64 disc drive, but was still a very well-made exploration and action game that had a fantastic sense of scale. The N64 was starving for content, they hid the missing pieces very well, and people had little else for the adventure and story that the game provided. If I hadn't enjoyed games with similar appeals and flaws as Phantom Pain, would I have enjoyed it as much? or even had the patience to deal with its flaws without knowing a game that had a similar fault. It's very easy to not have fun when your playstyle or motivation doesn't work with the structure of the game. At one point I made a review of the PS2 Grand Theft Auto games and was incredibly harsh on GTA 3 because my judgement was primarily based on the story missions, but I found the game to be much more satisfying once I relaxed and didn't focus so much on just beating the game. I recall not liking most missions on my first go, but found enjoyment through replaying, like how Dark Souls and Metal Gear Solid 3 were more fun for me once I had a handle on them. I also played the game when the outcry against the game was basically finished, so there wasn't a constant fresh reminder of the flaws or the potentially missing content, like how Ocarina of Time's missing content wasn't known until much later. Playing new games is at least partially informed by how you've played previous games and the state of mind you were in while playing. A strong enough common game history and tolerance can allow one, or many, to appreciate what games do so much better. Don't consider this a review of Phantom Pain, because it's not. A good review should be able to recommend a game based on potential tastes and preference. And I can't exactly say who Phantom Pain will appeal to most, because my only answer to that is me. This also isn't intended to be a call out to people who don't like Phantom Pain either. This is more of a thought experiment of breaking down why you enjoy something that is undeniably flawed or unfinished. What bugs everyone in video games is different, so some negatives may be seen as tolerable if enough speaks to your style and expression. Phantom Pain hits this spot for me very well, fitting into a lot of my sensibilities and working with my tastes to give me something I can sink my teeth into. This isn't inherently about Phantom Pain though, as there are many flawed games I enjoy in spite of their flaws. Phantom Pain just seems to have the worst reputation of the moment. So I hope you'll think about what you may consider tolerable flaws in games you enjoy and aren't just inherently dismissive of people who dislike something you treasure. There's no perfect games, my friends. Just games that are perfect for their audience. Later. Thanks for watching. If you want to see a lot of my initial impressions of Metal Gear Solid 5, you can actually watch my entire Let's Play if you want to. And be sure to check out my other series, which I should be getting back to, Great Game Gals. And I hope you'll like, sub, and all that other good stuff. Massive thank you to GhostHawk825, who was actually the person who Steam gifted me this game. Thank you, man. You've given me a game I absolutely loved.